Nicknamed Deedles, she has become one of jazz music's reigning queens. Blinded at birth, she went on to develop her musical talents to the point that by age 10, she was already performing shows. With her distinctive piano playing and rich voice, she's recorded over 20 albums and is headlined at Carnegie Hall and the White House and has collaborated with such musical greats as Quincy Jones, B.B. King, Dizzy Gillespie, Ray Charles, and Stevie Wonder. Hello, I'm Ernie Manoos. Coming up on interviews, our conversation with multi-Grammy award-winning artist, Diane Shuer. Does any of the joy leave music for you when it became a business? No, Ernie. To be honest with you, no. The joy hasn't left. Um, it's it's just a part of what you know some people would call the game. Yeah. And after so many years of being a professional, I just kind of learned to accept pretty much the different elements of, of show business and um, that's just one of the elements and I'm, I'm just loving living in it yeah you've had a wonderful career and the opportunity to live in it but it's something you always wanted to do wasn't it yeah you know I was reflecting um, that on the 4th of October of 1996 um, I did a broadcast with Elmo for PBS on Sesame Street. And that was, what, 16 years ago now. <laughs> Time flies. I, I know. <laughs> I know. So it was very exciting at the time to do, and I went to my website and looked at it. It was really kind of neat. Talking about your website, I hear you are all wrapped up in the uh, the electronic media world. Yes, Um I've been into computers, um, well, it'll be 12 years next April, and uh, I I really love it. I have a desktop at home, and then I carry a laptop everywhere, and I'm able to watch what they call uh, uh, Sling Player, or I call it Slinger. Slingbox. Yeah, I call it Slinger. And, uh, <laughs> have, of course, I watch PBS, naturally. And for people who don't know what Slingbox is, it connects you back to your home television so you can watch whatever would be in your own home. That is correct. That's, it's a trip because, you know, like if you're in cent- the central time zone, <clears throat> you can watch anything that's, you know, you know I, I, since I live in California, of course, it's Pacific time. So it's it's really a lot of fun, and I'm, I download books. And, and <laughs> it is strange how computers have changed our world and brought mm-hmm. everything so much closer and intimate. Yeah, it's it's amazing. I mean, music and everything else. A few years back, there was a lot of controversy over Napster and the file sharing and all that. Oh, What's I your know. take on all of that? Well, it's part of the process, Aaron. It's just part of the process, and. Um, you know, of course, now people have to pay for um, anything that they get. You know, it's it's like I say, it's just, it was just like the Wild West, um, yeah. you know, at first as far as the computer world. It's very natural. YouTube, um, there's lots of hits, you know, as far as, you know, people going to see the things, you know, that I've done. And some of them might be bootlegged, but hey... Whatever you know, whatever works works. Recently, there was a big sensation on a TV talent show about a young girl getting up and singing, and uh, it came all back to me when I was listening to one of your most recent albums. Yes. And in it, you have placed one of the songs you recorded when you were ten years old. Correct. Explain a little behind that. Well, you know, as you know, the latest album, "Some Other Time," is a tribute to my mother and her legacy that she gave me as far as love of jazz. And uh, I, I thought that it would really be cool if we could incorporate one of the, the, the first song that I actually did. Uh, I auditioned at the Holiday Inn when I was 10 years old. It was a Saturday <laughs> afternoon on January 4th. And um, 
And it was called September in the Rain. And, of course, back then I was really trying to emulate Dinah Washington, you know, and her sound and everything. Then when I did my first country record when I was 17 years old, the late Jimmy Wakeley says, Now, Diane, you've got to get away from sounding so much like Dinah Washington. I thought, <laughs> okay. Who are the other people that I really love to emulate and, and st- you know, style and so on? And one of them was um, Patty Page. And so... I thought, okay, let's see if this works. And so I did the tune kind of like Patty and with a little bit of a twist. So, uh, you know, the curly cues in different places and bending the notes and so on. So, yeah, it's, uh, but the September in the Rain song was a wonderful. I'm glad that we could incorporate it. And of course, then followed Danny Boy because Mama loved that song and, and of course, it took a few years for me to do it, but I was able to do that. And because mom died when I was thirteen, and she was only thirty-one, so how does that affect a child at that age? Do you think children a lot of times don't know how to, um, or have through no fault of the parents, been given the skills to cope as well? Um, I I remember. I cried a little bit, but I was dry-eyed at the funeral, and and it hasn't been up until recent years that um, I really, really felt the loss of my mother. Yeah. Because, you know, mothers represent a bonding, which is so interesting. Uh, when I was born, I was placed in an incubator shortly after my birth because I was born two months premature and um, they felt that was the only way that my life could be uh, saved but in doing so I lost uh, that bonding with my mom Mm -hmm. and for babies it's so important in fact they have a practice with that you know making sure that kids can bond with their parents at birth and you know, so it's just been in like in recent years that I've really learned, you know, that holding hands with a good friend or whatever is is okay, and um, you know, and not to be so startled if somebody comes up to me and puts their hand on my shoulder or whatever, because I used to get really startled. I still do sometimes, especially like if I'm on an airplane and I'm under headphones and I'm really wrapped up in what's going on in there. So it's just. Oh, <laughs> you know, <so laughs> the, it really is kind of like a snapping too, you know, coming back. And but um, <clears throat> but anyway, that's you know, it's life experience um, is a trip. I'm telling you. When you talk about the being ten years old and recording the song, I think a lot of people worry. What was your childhood like? Was she being pranced out there and paraded out there? This was something you loved, correct? Yeah. Yeah, and I, I I loved going out there and and performing. Um, I know that John Bradshaw, who did a lot of stuff for PBS, mm-hmm. and I when after I got sober, um, uh, I almost I have almost twenty one years of sobriety actually. Um, <clears throat> talked about. Um, Oh, what was it, you know, about the inner child and so on. It, it's just really uh, just very, very interesting stuff. Yeah. Yeah, and that's, I was leading to something, and I'm trying to remember exactly. <laughs> We're talking about your joy as yeah, a child. Yeah, and my joy as a child, and I think that's one of the things that he talked about in the workshops. You know, there was the uh, the wounded child and so on, but then there's the wonder child. Uh, and that's, I think... In going out there, uh, but I learned about the dynamics of the family system. That's what I was trying to get to, and what John Bradshaw uh, talked about is is people that were the star of the family. And I guess I was the star of the family in that dynamic, although I still was able to really spread that childlike kind of joy. I think that's why adults would start to cry, you know, because that's what joy does with people. It often brings tears. Joy, it, it's like what um, uh, Khalil Gibran says in the 
book, The Prophet, that joy and sorrow are inseparable. And I, I think there's really something to be said for that. When you talked earlier about Diana Washington and yes. your affinity toward her and uh, the questions about emulating an artist, at what point do you realize you have your own voice and you can separate from those that have influenced you? When I really started getting into jazz, um, that's when... <clears throat> I mean, I've always been in jazz, but I'm not exactly sure, Ernie, what exactly when it happened. It's just one of those processes that just builds and builds over time. And a lot of people say, just from hearing one note that I do, oh, yeah, that's Diane Sure, that's Deedles or Deeds. And um, <clears throat> there's, you know, with a lot of artists, there's just no mistaking yeah. that first note for sure. Okay, you mentioned Deedles. I need to know, where did that nickname come from? Well, my mom, when she was alive... Nick, nicknamed me Deedle Babe. And <laughs> so as a result, Deedles came out of Deedle Babe. And, uh, and yet within the name Deedles, there's God. There's so many nicknames, even within the nickname Deedles. It's, you know, Deeds, Deedly Weedly, Deedly Do. <laughs> My manager calls me Deedle Baber. Hello, Deedle Baber. <laughs> <laughs> When does the trans- You'll probably kill me for saying that, but <laughs> <laughs> anyway. When does the transformation come that you can use words like cat and cool baby and all that, that jazz lingo? When does that become part of one's vernacular? Well, I remember I, I, I had I, and still have a very, very dear friend who got me really engrossed in people like Charlie Parker, um, Fats Navarro, um, you know, all all sorts of different people. And I guess oh, it, it just, for a person like me, it's always been a part of the vernacular because I've always been exposed to it. It's It's just kind of really what people would say is kind of like a hip, kind of language all of its own. And it in and jazz, even though in the United States it's not recognized in a lot of circles as much as it is outside of the United States in like in Asia, you know, Europe and Japan and so on, it still touches everything. Commercials, you know what I mean? They they use they don't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing and in many commercials there was a oh, kind of like a disco thing uh, that they they put to Dinah Washington's "Is You Is" or "Is You Ain't My Baby." Right. Uh, you remember that? Yeah. Um, it's it's just amazing uh, how much jazz has become part of our culture, and yet there's so many people that wouldn't even recognize that. Right. You, you dig? Yeah. So. Do you find that the outside of the U.S. there's a different reception to the style of music you do than within this country? Yes. There's a saying that a prophet is never really known in his own country. And, you know, that's kind of a figurative way to state it. But for some reason, um, jazz is embraced a lot more in uh, other countries for, for whatever reason. And uh, but, but you never know. Maybe, maybe the cycle will change. Yeah. There was a time in your career where people questioned your commitment to jazz. They felt there was quite a bit of pop influence and all of that. Where's well, they're going to be questioning it again. I hear friend. what's coming, yeah. <laughs> oh, you heard, hey. You're going country. Yeah, you heard. <laughs> oh, my God. How did you, how did you hear about that? Well, well you, we, we check into people you, you, before you, we oh, sit down with them. <laughs> country. Huh? Oh, I bet Jack White or someone, someone told, I, I, okay, okay. Yes, it's exciting. And, you know, I can thank Ray Charles for that. Really? Yeah, because... He did it. He did the same thing in the late '60s, early '70s. He had a country album, and, and you know, out, and it went really, really good. What I'm hoping that my concept of this uh, is taken seriously is 
Daddy really loved country music, still loves country music, and my mom was into jazz. And so um, it's a wonderful tune. It's a gospel tune. In fact, getting back to Mr. Bradshaw again, <laughs> they use this theme for a lot of the inner child work uh, going home. And that's what I'm hoping to kind of have this album be embraced about. Yeah. yeah, the song going home. You've heard the song, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So, and and you know, and there's going to be other material on there too. And I'm I'm really I'm really excited about it. Are you at a point in your career where you don't get nervous about doing that? That you have enough confidence in your own talent and skill that you can just move yes. forward? Yes. How does that build? Through time, um, through experience of life, I think that I. Now in in my going into my fifty seventh year of existence, I think I'm really ready to uh, encapsulate uh, emotionally a lot of what the brand of country music that we're going to be getting into. Um, I think I'm 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 ready. Is this going to upset the jazz purists? You know what, Ricky Nelson sang. Can't please everyone, so you got to please yourself. Yeah. And if it upsets them, well, that's just, you know, it's tough. It's just tough. It's like, um, I love jazz, but I need to be exposed in a bigger market. Mm-hmm. And you were talking about, you know, money or commercialism does it take the joy out of it no it doesn't take the joy out of it at all in fact you know it can add to it after a while (laughs) in addition to the commercial success and the career and all that i hear you're on a spiritual path now that's opening up for you yes what led to that i think um when a person is presented with challenges. Um, I'm not wearing mascara, so if a couple of teardrops fall, it's not going to matter. Um, I think for myself that it's it's forced me on some levels to seek the spiritual out. And I'm glad that I have. It's in, on On some levels, my faith has been tested in a way that I, you know, I, I never, I never even dreamed possible. But at the same time, out of all of the challenges and stuff, there's growth, yeah. and that's that's what's happening for me. Um, you know, um, my wonderful husband that I've been married to for almost fifteen years has Parkinson's disease, and. Um, and it's really a challenge and but you know we love each other enough that no matter what we stand tall and 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 together whatever needs to be faced and that's that's the true grit of being married and being with somebody that you love a lot what are you finding though on this path that's helping you through this what are the truths that you're discovering that love is all inclusive yeah. Yeah, that love is all inclusive and will carry carry me through. Um and I thank God that, you know, first and foremost above all, you know, I thank God for my sobriety because it's really helping me uh especially through times that can be a little bit challenging. But but there's always you know, there's always the sunbeam um, and the rainbow within that sunbeam, and I, I, I thank God. I, I wouldn't trade. You know what I mean? I wouldn't tr- trade for anything. I, I would live my life every step of the way. I would live my life exactly the way that I'm living it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Because Stevie Wonder said it so beautifully. Uh, you brought the joy inside my tears. And, um, yeah, that's, that kind of like says it all. You've mentioned your sobriety a couple of times and 
I have, I think we all in today's society have friends that you see that are enjoying the drink a little too far. So for you, how did you know when it was time to stop? What was the final thing that said, I need to move on? Um, I think it was my, I think it was my last suicide attempt. Um, and I'd tried that at least once before and there was that jumping off place and I knew that I was at a crossroad and I knew that uh, there's just a light that came on in my head um, it was it was I'll, I'll just never forget um, my brother-in-law uh, who stood there and I was about to jump out you know, jump out the off the uh, third story um, balcony of the place where I lived, and he just stood there and he didn't grab for me or anything like that. But you know, then I kind of like put my arms around him and I I cried, but it was like a different kind of crying than I'd ever experienced before, and I knew that I had actually really, really, really hit bottom. And a friend of mine the next day asked me. Deedly Weedley, his name's David Freeman. He's no longer with us, but he asked me a very simple but profound question. Deedly Weedley, do you think you might be an alcoholic? And nobody had asked me that before. People would say, well, Deeds, you drink too much and so on. But as far as having a question actually posed to me was so... It gave me, it gave me time to pause and really yeah. think about it, and that's when the spiritual awakening, as it's called, really started to happen for me. And um, ever since then, it's been it's been a quest of a spiritual path. And yes, through drugs and alcohol, I. I was on a quest for a spiritual path, and I thought that I'd found it, but it was it was extremely elusive. But yet at the same time, Ernie, I don't regret doing those things either because it put me here. Mm-hmm. It put me here exactly where I'm meant to be right now at this moment. And my, you know, my axiom is to live in the present, not belabor the future, and not stay too long in the past, but to just try to keep a real balance, a a sense of balance. And that's what I'm endeavoring to do, and it feels really, it feels really good. Even sometimes when it doesn't feel so pleasant, it's still... (laughs) To be able to feel the feelings. I think, you know, when you and I were talking about the weight loss, I've dropped about 60 pounds in the past two years. It was 64, but um, got on the scale, and I guess I gained five (laughs) pounds. But you can call that boob weight. Yeah, (laughs) okay. (laughs) Oh, he's blushing over there. (laughs) So... I think I'm blushing a little myself. I, I think you are a little bit too. <laughs> I think I still have a little bit of innocence in me, you know. But um, it's such a trip, and it's such a process. And, you know, to be able to feel the joy, um, that's what I like to try to exude in my singing, in my work. I was going to say, if is this in some way, and I don't mean to be stereotypic of country it's okay. music, it's okay. but it's kind of an uplifting kind of fun feeling music is this kind of a feeling of where you are emotionally yes yes absolutely Uh, no doubt absolutely i'm i'm just i'm just so excited and just you know they say in astrological terms that things are lining up and it feels like that for me yeah yeah. After country, then what? Rap album? What do you got planned next? I don't think so. <laughs> maybe, maybe what you and I were talking about—the spiritual path kind of album. Yeah. I'm not necessarily fixed in a denominational kind of thing because there is a difference for me. There's a difference between religion and spirituality, and I choose to to be in 
the spirituality um, uh, kind of a uh, kind of a vein, and I'm, I'm just really that's that's what I see, you know, uh, possibly happening. I mean, like the path that I love so much is uh, one of my favorite prayers is the Saint Francis prayer, you know. Lord, make me a channel of thy peace. You've heard that, I'm oh, sure. Yes, I have. It's one of the most... It's interesting. You, have you ever heard of Gregorian? Oh, yeah. Well, my manager, Jackie, uh, Jack White, and I, we do some of this stuff like uh, the St. Francis Prayer. We do it in Gregorian. Uh, so maybe a chant album is coming? I don't know. You, ne- <laughs> you never know. It's... Uh, yeah, I guess some people would call it chanting, and but it for me, it you know, it for me, it just gives me a real opportunity to to get into that realm of spirit. Well, whatever it leads you to, we're so happy it's brought you here today. Well, thank me you for too. all the music thank and a pleasure you. to talk with you. And you too, Ernie. Thank you. Oh, you're wonderful. Thank you so much, and I will continue to watch PBS, I promise. (laughs) (laughs) Diane Shure. To order a DVD of this or any episode of interviews, please visit HoustonPBS.org.